All right, so Blake is just about ready to go with the session planning with Spy Tools. Thank you. So good evening. Thanks for um, uh, coming out this evening. I wanted to talk to you about uh, how you can do astronomical session planning with the, uh, a particular piece of software. Um, I'm a big fan of this software. Admittedly, I've been using it for about um, eight years um, now. Uh, this can be used for uh, uh, visual uh, astronomy planning, and it can also be used for photographic planning. Um, I specifically have the Pro or Professional Edition of Sky Tools, and that includes some of the photographic elements. But I'm not going to emphasize that this evening. I'm going to concentrate on the um, one particular edition, the standard um, edition, which um, I think is very popular and um, uh, covers off um, uh, doing vi visual uh, astronomy. This is a very different sort of breed of software. This is a, a different animal. It's not like Sky Safari or Starry Night or Stellarium in, in that those tools generally present very nice planetarium views, r quite realistic views of the sky, and then have some other features to help you find objects and maybe log them and so on. The emphasis of Sky Tools is very, very different. Um, you'll see as I uh, demonstrate it. Um, I started using this software um, on Friday, the 27th of August, 2010. Two days later, I had built my first observing list, and now I feel naked if I don't have this software <laughs> with me when I'm planning, when I'm at the telescope. So um, I, I won't go into our sort of whole history of how we came by this, but... Um, I quite like this software. Um, so why would you want to use this? Why do I need it? Um, for me personally, I need targets. I need things to look at. I, I need goals. I, I need a checklist. And I was sort of doing these things by hand. I wanted to know about new sort of current objects that were visible, like comets or transient things like an outburst or a supernova. I wanted to know about things like that and have those on my observing list. I, I, uh, I would cull together data from a lot of different sources and it took forever um, to, to do this. Um, and, and I've been sort of casually, I haven't been going after certificates per se, but I've been casually trying to work through some of the popular lists like the Messier um, observing list and the finest um, NGC, RASC NGC list, and, and so on. So I've, I've just been working through these lists and checking things off, but again, I wanted to sort of have everything as much as possible in one place. More and more, I was taking my little computer, my netbook out with me during observing sessions, and if I could drive the telescope, but I was also using it to visually confirm what I was seeing in the eyepiece. Um, and I, I, early on, I was using Stellarium, and I was struggling with, with that, because I, I have a modest telescope. I have, my first telescope was a Celestron 8-inch SCT, and, and to a skilled observer, you can see magnitude 14. So I was seeing objects beyond what Stellarium at the time could present to me and getting confused. So I wanted a tool that was highly accurate, um, correctly presented as, as much as possible, um, star fields with magnitude 13 and 14 stars in it. And if you know me, you know I like double stars. I also wanted to, if I was looking at double stars, particularly a binary system, I wanted to see where the A and B stars were in relation to one another fairly accurately. So uh, I was looking for software in 2009 trying to find something that would Sat satisfy the, these requirements. And I did, I did a lot of research. Um, I, I looked at Astro Planner, I looked at Deep Sky Planner, I tried out a couple of the websites that have planning capabilities. Um, at the time, I couldn't try, actually get my hands on Sky Tools because they did not have a demo or a trial version. That is not the case now. You can try the software before you buy. 
Um, so, so, but it was upon recommendations of some other members, notably Phil Chow and Ian Wheelvan, um, that sort of convinced me that Sky Tools was going to be the best choice. Um, you will note that um, of the formal software applications, only Astro Planner runs natively on a Macintosh. That said, I know of lots of people that run uh, Sky Tools I in emulators on a Mac, and I know of no problems with that. Um, so just be aware of that if you're sensitive to the specific operating system. There's sadly few options for the Mac. Um, so what I'd like to do now is give you a demo of the software, show you what it looks like. Again, I, you're going to see that I'm running the Pro version, but I'm not going to overly emphasize the, the, those features. I'm going to show capabilities of the standard edition. And I want to really focus on the planning as opposed to the post, the logging types of things, sort of what, why we, you would want to use this software ahead of an observing session. So I'm just going to switch over here. Um, and uh, what, what you'll see coming up um, on my screen right away, this is the first screen that you see when you start up SkyTools. No charts. SkyTools does do charts. Don't get me wrong, and I'll, I'll show you those. Um, but you, you can see clearly there's a list um, here. And uh, th this list was assembled uh, ahead of time. I'll show you how to build one. Um, but clearly it's got a mixture of objects. There's some deep sky objects in there. There's some planets. Um, in that list, there's some double stars, variable stars, open clusters, galaxies, etc. Um, and you can see there's lots of details. So there's quite a lot of information being displayed already in this list. You can see the the right ascension and the declination values. You can see there's distances showing in one of those columns. Um, uh, there there's some columns that indicate the uh, or can indicate the rise and set times, but you'll see there's a begin and end, and there's an optimum column there. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail shortly. You can see there's a diffi difficulty uh, index or assessment. So the tool actually knows about a lot of things about me and about my telescope. It know knows the, the magnitude limitations and the resolution of the telescope. It knows about the eyepieces that I have, um, and you can see it's even recommending an eyepiece. A really quick thing that you can do is look at the street light, traffic light indicator. Green is good. Those little green balls means these are good objects to go for on this particular evening. The ones that are yellow or red are going to be out of range. Maybe they're off season, maybe they're very, very low in the horizon, maybe the moon, <coughs> stupid moon is out. Um, interfering with your ability to look at <laughs> at uh, faint dim objects. Um, so this is classic sort of screen, the hub, if you will, when you fir first start using this tool. You can sort by these columns. I'll click on RA, sort it by that, or you can click on distance. Uh, but typically I sort by optimum. Um, and that's to sort the objects um, that are in this list in a very particular way for the observing session. Um, you, you can um, uh, see above this list that there's a bunch of controls here. A lot of these are filters, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but near the top is something called the night bar. And if you look closely, printing's a little blurry there, but you can see it's centered on midnight. And, and you'll see that it goes from white, this is daylight, um, and starts getting darker. Um, around 2100, and it's quite dark at 2200. So this is simulating sunset. And then we move through midnight, and you can see that at about 430, um, it starts getting gray and then white. That's the sun coming up. So this black portion is what we're interested in. That's your nighttime observing window. Um, you, if you look really closely, you can see that it's actually gray and then go poof, goes dark between 3 and 4 o'clock or so. Um, so what's that? That's the moonlight. That's being simulated as well. So the tool is taking into account the moonlight or the moon phase um, that's occurring. And you'll see, if you look very closely, there's also a, a curving arc 
uh, blue dashed lines here. And that's indicating the path of the moon and that it's falling and it's setting at 3.30. And then it gets really dark. This is tonight, right, May 23rd, at the Science Center. And this is taking into account local lighting conditions. It knows about light pollution. Um, for a particular city, you can dial that up or down as needed. <coughs> and it, it knows the telescope that I want to use. I've told it which telescope I want to use, and that's where all the eyepieces are coming from. But let, let's say I'm doing some long-range planning that between Christmas and New Year's, while I'm visiting my mom, um, I, I want to plan for an observing session. Um, so I can set the date to some point in the future, so I'll hop out, out to December and around the 28th or so, and I'm going to say okay, and see, w see what changed there? See the night bar? Much wider now, of course, longer nights. What Andy talked about, we're near the, the solstice, so short nights in the northern hemisphere, but on December 28th, it's the opposite. That's one of the longest nights, and you can see, see that gray showing up at midnight? Moon's coming up. Um, but this shows that for five hours, you could look in nearly black skies. Um, for, from here at the Science Center, I'll change the location um, to somewhere, somewhere different. So I have lots of locations programmed uh, in, in here, um, but I'll, I'll choose somewhere else. May, maybe um, uh, that, that uh, I'll be near London. Um, and it, it's hard to tell there, but that got a bit uh, washed out. It's not as black um, uh, as it was. Um, so again, it's taking into account light pollution. Let me switch lists here. This is just a random list that I built for demonstration purpose, a wide variety of objects. But let's say we're working on our Messier certificate <coughs> and we want to look at objects that are well placed in the evening. So I'm just going to switch here to a different group. Groups are like folders. And then within the group, um, there's different lists. Um, that's available. There's the Messier list. You can see there's a Herschel 400. Um, there's a Rask finest list in there. Some double a double star from the Astronomical League, and so on. Those are built-in ones, ready to go um, in the tool. But the Messier one popped up, and there they are. There's there's a listing of of all the Messier objects. If you look closely at the number down at the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see it's 113. That's because we have some objects that are kind of double things, different things. It's a diffuse nebula with an open cluster in the middle of it. So, so we've got some higher counts going on because of that. There's the complete list though, but you may know that in general, you can only see all of the Messier objects maybe in March or April with a concerted campaign um, where, where you're doing the Messier marathon. Um, but other times of the year, it may be very difficult, if not impossible, to see all the Messier objects. So I'm going to tell the software that I don't want to look at all these objects right now. I only want to look at things that are above the horizon. And you can see the list is still saying 113. But I'll tell it that I only want to look at them in complete darkness. So I've filtered this out, and now I've gone to 78 um, objects. I'm also going to tell it that I want to use a visibility factor. These objects need to be visible. Um, so that's dropped it to 44. Um, I'm going to tell it I want objects that are easy. That's what I use for star parties. When I'm prepping for star parties, I want eye candy, low-hanging fruit. I want wow, cool things <laughs> to show people in the IPs, not faint fuzzies that people go, I don't see anything. Um, so, <laughs> so, so that's a good short list of you know, good, good candidates there that are highly visible. And I can put time restrictions on it too to further filter this. It's a small object, but uh, I'm going to tell it I'll start it um, not uh, 7 o'clock, so it's shortening the list up some more. So the filtering's really useful um, for making sure that you're, you're seeing good, good objects that, that are visible now, tonight. Um, and if I make a point of sorting this by optimum um, and click on the first object, do you see that red line? I'll click on a couple. Watch over here. Watch the red line jumping around. See it moving? So as I click on an object, it's showing me where it's going to be in the sky. So I click on M15, and it's peaking or culminating at 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Obviously, I can't see it then. Um, but it's starting to arc or fall <coughs> down. But when it starts getting dark, when I'm ready to observe, 
um, it's just falling below this horizontal green line and getting lower and lower and it sets just before midnight. So this is showing me I should look at the object early in the evening, not late in the evening, um, it'll be gone. And the objects like the cigar and Bode's galaxy and the beehive, I shouldn't look at these at the beginning of the evening. Um, I, I should look at them later. If I click on cigar, see what's happening? At seven o'clock it's low, but it's rising through the <coughs> evening. It'll be better at midnight, moon comes up, but um, it culminates at three or four o'clock in the morning. That's that's the good time to look at objects when they're high, right? Um, the green horizontal line um, is at the 30 degree mark and that, that's the threshold for two atmospheres. If you look at objects above 30 degrees, you're looking through less than two atmospheres. If you look at things below that 30 degree line, you're looking through more than two atmospheres. So you get high extinction. So this helps you determine when to look at objects. Photographers, they use the kind of the 45 degree rule and up, but th this gives you a good sort of rule of thumb of where, where things are sitting in the sky. They can be very low all the way up to the top edge, and that's 90 degrees. So if I walk <coughs> through the list really quickly, this is showing objects that go very high, like M34 is almost straight up um, at nine o'clock. So I've sorted these in a good, a good sequence. So so th this is a key feature for me of Sky Tools that I'll collect together a list of objects that I'd like to look at, but then I get the software to help me figure out if they're viable, if they're decent, when they're going to be well placed in the sky, give me the right sequence in which to look at these objects um, or, or to photograph them. Um, so, so that's a, a built-in list, the Messier one, that we can, we can use or look at. And, and again, I wanted to show you the, the night bar, how we kind of use it to determine what things are going to look like in the evening. And you can see we can do sorting and filtering on it. On any of these objects, if you wanted more information, let me, let me go back to my, my general purpose list there for demonstration. On any of these objects, if I wanted some more information <coughs> on them, I can easily double click on one of them. And uh, let me just bring over this panel for you to look at here. So here I've double clicked on an NGC object and I, and I can see some of the alternate names. Um, in the case of an open cluster, the colander number, or the OCL catalog number. I can see magnitude and the size of it and some other details. Notice all the tabs down at the bottom. So th this is about building observing lists or copying from observing <coughs> lists. So this is in a couple of different lists. I could keep my own notes. So I like the year bar a lot. Even the software author doesn't <laughs> promote this very much. But I, I quite like this. I've got it set for midnight. And this is showing me that this object is best viewed, you can see, in the fall. Um, so that I find that very useful from an imaging point of view. Wh when's the best time to shoot an object? Is it in or out of season? And there's that horizontal green line, two air mass line again. Let me double click on a double star. Um, and here, here you can see details about the double star, how the position angle and the um, uh, separation, usually in arc seconds, um, for that. There's the uh, Washington Double Star Database official designation for that double star. I'm gonna look for a double star um, that's got the swirly pattern, little icon here, 72 peg. Um, that's a binary, there's the calculated um, period um, and calculated position angles and, and so on. So it's telling us how, how long the orbit will be of the B star <coughs> to the primary um, there. If we double click on a planet, of course we get details about the planet, how far away it is in astronomical <laughs> units, the phase of it, um, how it's illuminated, um, the, the moons that are associated with that planet. So lots and lots of details um, are available for all these objects. Um, so, so that's nice. Um, that uh, it's quite rich, this tool, in terms of details. Something very interested, I interesting about this tool, and I think that even a lot of people that have been using Sky Tools for years don't fully appreciate, is the, uh, that the author has vetted the data um, that's being presented in here. Lots of tools include the list of all of the NGC objects, and there's no one errors in the NGC catalogs. It, there's even confusing elements in the, the Messier. Um, catalog. There's a couple of ambiguous entries there. The, the author um, of Sky Tools, the Skyhound developer 
Um, he has tried to resolve a lot of these issues and clarify a lot of these issues. So it's really interesting. The catalog information generally is very, very good. This is not perfect. I don't want to make it seem like there aren't any issues with this software, but it's the best of breed, it's, it, I think. Um, now, let's, uh, let's build a list, and we can do it together um, here. So let's make a new list. Let's say we're going to go up to the uh, Carr Astronomical Observatory for June 13th. Uh, let me actually, let me change that location um, to uh, the car. There's the CAO, and I'll set the date uh, again for this um, to uh, do tonight right now, just to do it quickly. And then um, I'll jump ahead. So there's the 13th, 14th weekend, and I think that's a new moon weekend. Narrow window of opportunity, as Andy pointed out. So we got to be on our game and work quickly um, and look at objects in a good sequence. Let's build a new list. So I'll, I'll create a new observing list. I'll make sure it goes into our example uh, bucket um, here, or group. But we'll call this um, CAO weekend for example, and let me switch to it. Of course, this is a brand new list, so it, it's going to be empty. All right, what's going to be a good planet to look at in, um, in uh, that period of time? What do you want to look at? Jupiter. Jupiter? Okay. We can look at Jupiter. <coughs> There's a search for Jupiter. There's a search result. Of course, it gives... Uh, um, a fuzzy search result, so you can see Ghost of Jupiter, Planetary Nebula comes up here. There's uh, a few other objects that are listed here. Um, I'm going to make sure this goes again to my new list. Um, I can direct found objects to different places, but I'll add it to the list. There it is. What else do you want to look at? Um, another planet? I don't know about you. But I, it's not a planet. <laughs> um, I'm looking at Mars. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mars is close. It's going to be good. Um, so there we go. There's those uh, added. Um, yes, yes, Pluto is in here. Okay, why well, Pluto? Um, so so there, there we go. But notice it's not listed but it ca because I have my filters active. So let me relax the filters here. Um, so there, there's all our objects. Um, do you, do you want to look at a planet, one of the, or excuse me, a moon, one of those difficult moons? Do you remember the, the moon that um, Andy suggested we look at? Amalia. Amalia. Right? So, so moons are listed in the catalogs here, so we'll add that. Um, I have been trying and trying and trying to get uh, Deimos and Phobos um, here, so, so I've added those in. I've got a couple of the moons in here. Um, uh, do you want to look at any deep sky objects? Give me a deep sky object. That will be good that okay, time. Okay, the ring, 57. The ring. So we can do it either way. We can do the ring nebula. Um, that was too broad a cert, so uh, do it again there. There's ring nebula. You could also search by, by the, <coughs> the Messier number, right? So I'll add to list. Uh, a globular that Andy um, suggested? M13. M13. So notice I've just done a really short form there, M13. Easy to search for an object that way. Um, I'm going to look for a double star, Tau, Cygni. Um, <laughs> so, so there's Tau. Uh, I'll add that in. Um, and when you're searching for um, NGCs, you can use a nice short form. You just put the number. Um, so 6503 there, and it, and it finds that object. So it, things like Markarian chains, something like that? Just um, it, 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 it does have a... It does have a few things like that. Let's try it, Markarian. So, yeah. So it, uh, there, it does have a lot of alternate <laughs> words in it um, that we can use, but sometimes you'll have to search by some other means. Um, so, so you usually you can do a search one way or another. Now, in the the pro version. Um, which I have, there's also the database power <laughs> search. And now you can start searching by criteria. Oh, I want to look at objects that are between, between this magnitude and this magnitude in this constellation, um, and so on. Really rich searching 
if you get the pro version. Um, but uh, I won't show that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, Joel, to your question about keywords, um, I'm going to put in a very particular keyword here, galactic, and it's got some of the markers in it. it. I often get this question up at the CAO, hey, can we look at the center of the galaxy? I said, okay, uh, we can aim the telescope there, no, no problem, galactic center. Um, so, so you can easily add in some special markers in there as well um, if, if you want. So e this, this just allows you, you're reading a magazine, you go, oh, here's some cool objects that are listed, or oh, I'm watching this guy this month presentation, I'm going to note a few of these and I'll add those to my weekend campaign. So you can see you can easily add these into your, your list, no problem. Um, my, uh, another favorite feature of mine in the tool, though, is when I just want to look at stuff. <coughs> that, that's well placed in the sky. Or I need to get ready for um, a, a, a public star party um, or I'm supervising at the CAO and there's a bunch of kids coming up so I want to show them cool stuff that's well placed in the sky. <coughs> so in Sky Tools you can use this feature called the Nightly Observing List Generator. And what could be easier? Um, so, so if I'm doing star party stuff, I say give me the showpiece objects. Okay, um, and it knows my location, and I can tell it I want a big or small list. Um, here, we'll do large for now. And th this is very useful for people that use the built-in logging capabilities. I do not extensively use the logging inside Sky Tools, but I do mark um, or note that something is logged when I've had a very good view of it, um, I, I, I saw it well, um, or I imaged it well, I'll, I'll mark it as logged. And then I can exclude that here, and this helps me meet one of those first objectives um, that I listed with the software, that I want to look at unseen objects. I want to look at new stuff. I'm not going to turn that on for a star party, though. Um, so create the observing list. Let's see what we get here. So it's going through the huge database here. Um, it, do you have a sense of that? That Sky Tools is a database. It's running a whole bunch of databases, pulling from a whole bunch of different lists. I have the pro version, which has half a billion galaxies. Um, in it, um, and it's got stars to magnitude 20 um, in it. So it's pulling from, it's pulling from huge databases, um, and, and it just gave us things that are good um, on this evening, right? So there's a, a great eye candy stuff um, for the evening. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select all those objects, and I'm going to copy all these objects um, from this newly generated list to, to my CAO list. Um, and saying okay, and I'll flip over to that, and I have a handsome list now. Oop, um, I've got a, a good list now of things to, to look at on this weekend. And once again, I'll sort it by optimum, and here's the right sequence in which to show uh, all of these objects. Oh, I think I sorted it reverse. Um, so, so there's, oh, the moon's up at the top. Okay, whatever. Um, but then, <laughs> but then, then we can start chipping away at this list. And when I look at stuff in an evening, I mark it as observed, observed, observed. So that's kind of the check mark. I look at one, I don't get a good view of it, so I mark it re-observe. So I'm going to go back to it later or go back to it the next night. Maybe we're clouded out for a while. <coughs> um, and, and things that I really want to look at, I'll mark as not yet observed um, here. Um, and do and you see the, this weird yellow box there? That's, that's my permanent log. So the markings that I've just done, observe, not observed, uh, uh, return to them, reobserve, those are sessional um, markings. Um, so that's just for the evening or the weekend. But the yellow box is a permanent log entry. I've looked at it. I, you know, going back to it's just for fun. But in terms of maybe completing a certificate, I, I've seen it. It's done. It's checked off. What's in the log? Um, I'll pull up one of the log entries so it keeps up. Uh, I've got to pull it over here. Um, it keeps uh, the telescope details, the location, um, the uh, date. There's multiple log entries, right? You can record scene <coughs> conditions and transparency and stuff like that. Um, and then you can enter in detailed notes and images and other stuff in here. Um, so you can build up full log entry notes here. I don't, that part of Sky Tools I don't use. I do all that somewhere else. Um, but I, I at least tag that I've seen it um, here. 
And that's so I can use the exclusion setting um, when I'm using the nightly observing list generator to get lists of new objects I've never looked at. Um, so so that's, that's briefly the uh, logging capabilities um, in the tool. So again, I've really been focusing on the planning capabilities and, and using it during the evening um, here. So you're looking at cool stuff um, g given your objective for the evening or your personal targets. Um, uh, I haven't shown you the visual aspects of it in terms of charting. So does it do charts? Yes. Um, so let me pull up a chart here. I'll pull up the interactive atlas. Right clicking is used a lot in this tool. Um, so I'm pulling up an atlas. Let me just switch it uh, here again. So here's the interactive atlas that I've just generated um, for this. And you can see they're, while they're not photorealistic like say Stellarium is, um, these, these are still quite accurate sort of nice charts there. You can see the Milky Way is drawn in and the constellation lines can be turned on and off and uh, effective star uh, brightnesses and colors are all simulated um, in the tool. And there's my target. I had chosen Bode's galaxy. So where is it? And I can zoom in and out of this view very, very easily. See the blue circle or shape is starting to show up. There's usually a fairly accurate indication of the shape of the object, how it will appear. So I'm zooming in closer and closer and that might be very useful, this view alone, if you're doing classic star hopping. Um, you just pick your nearby starting point. Oh, I'll start from uh, Dubai, and I'll just head, head that way um, by star hopping, and you get, get to your object there. Um, uh, that, so I like the star charts here. This is the interactive atlas, um, and this will, you can tell it, show all 20 magnitude stars and show all the faint fuzzies um, that are in that field. Um, in combination with this, when I'm using this at the telescope, I use another view, which has a bit of a clunky name. It's called the Context Imager, uh, uh, the Eyepiece Imager Context Viewer. Uh, let me open that up. And, and you can see um, there's the galaxy in the center there. But if you look closely, that's my telescope yes. and an eyepiece in my telescope. Th this tool is the most accurate tool that I have found <coughs> in terms of showing me what I should see in the eyepiece. Or if I'm doing it the other way, I'm looking at something in the eyepiece going, what is that? And doing field identification in the software. I've not found anything so accurate as this. Um, that's your field of view. If you precisely enter in your telescope details, your eyepiece details, field of view, all that. Um, and it also considers the viewer, your age, your pupil dilation. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Yeah, <laughs> which I hate to tell you, <laughs> it's getting worse and worse. <laughs> but it, it also takes into account your experience level. Experienced users can see, viewers can see a half a magnitude or a full magnitude compared to a novice. So it takes all that into consideration. I like that you can rotate the field. I have a telescope with a mirror diagonal and I'm always changing the position of it. Um, so that was really important. That, that was a litmus test, this software, that had had that sort of capability. I'll, swi I'll switch to a different uh, object here. Let's look at, say, the, one of these nebula. Um, so I'll switch to that. And, and uh, here comes the simulated view of that nebula. There it is. And I'll switch to a different eyepiece um, here. So we'll dive in. I'll, I'll uh, go to my, uh, my yeah. nine, nine mil. Is that the nine mil? Um, oh, the four. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, <laughs> so that's a little bit too much. So we'll, so we'll, we'll just do some different eyepieces, and it's, it's simulating the view. Now I can still zoom in and out of that to say, oh, there's a field star. I see that. Um, so I quite like this context viewer there. Very, very nice. All right. One more chart that I'll show you here. This is very, very different. And it, it still, this still kind of freaks me out, um, this view, how you can use this. Um, so there's something called the telescope view, for lack of a better term, and it opens up a chart called the visual sky simulation. Um, and here's what it looks like. Um, and this is the new way to get to objects. And that you can't even really call this star hopping. It's not really star hopping. What this is showing you is that if you want to look at this galaxy, uh, let, me, let me zoom out here. Um, if you want to look at this galaxy, the Cigar Galaxy, aim your telescope in this area. 
So the top left corner is showing me where to just roughly put my telescope. If I zoom out a bit, you can see there's your Big Dipper, there's your markers. Aim the telescope from this distance to this distance, same distance in that line, put it about here. And then look through the finder and you should see these stars. Now maybe you're off a little bit. Um, so, so you look for these stars. If you're lucky, you'll see the object right away. But when you see those stars, then um, you can shift a little bit the telescope as needed and get in that area and look through the eyepiece and you'll see the object. It's three steps and it's not even star hopping. It's not hop, 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 hop. It's just aim in this general area, fine tune it, look through the eyepiece and if you're lucky, you're on the object. And the first couple of times I did this, I went, this feels like I'm cheating. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, is, this is too easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now I, I use the pro version, so I have real-time mount control, so now I really feel like I'm cheating, because I have my observing list, and I click on the object, and I tell it, slew to that object. And then I look through the eyepiece, and it's there. So I really do feel like I'm cheating with this software. It's just amazing. So clearly there's lots of um, uh, visual charts that are available in the standard and the pro editions of the, of the software. I'm going to switch back to my presentation now, and I just have a couple of concluding slides. Thanks for your patience um, here, and uh, bear with me for a second. Just to... So uh, i give you a little demo there of the <laughs> software. Um, so I've been using this software for over 2,800 days, and I'm still learning stuff. But I, I just find it's absolutely essential for me. I use it for my planning. I use it as much as possible during my observing sessions. And um, I do logging in it as well and do corroboration and double checking of things um, for my log notes. Um, this helps me prepare better. It, it's helping me complete lists, um, complete campaigns. It's helping me go deeper. I, I generally want the computer with me, so a, a fringe benefit is I'm using less paper. And in the end, I'm getting more photons, either into my retina um, or onto my camera chip. Um, so this tool I found in, in indispensable in that respect. <laughs> this, is, this is not trivial. <coughs> Sky Tools is not cheap. I have some good news about that. Um, it's not the cheapest tool out there. Um, it's commercial software. It's a little bit expensive. It's not a simple interface. It took me a while to acclimate to it. it. Already it's a different way of working. Again, you're starting from a list. You're not looking at charts right away. Um, again, it's Windows specific, although it works in a Mac emulator. And it wants a lot of screen real estate too. Um, so you're going to have to go buy another big monitor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There, there's three editions that you may be interested in. The starter edition, which you can try for free, is suitable for a small instrument, three, four inch telescope. Um, the standard edition is good for people with eight, 10 inch telescopes, gives you the list and sharing capabilities. Um, the pro edition has real time mount control and has um, photographic uh, capabilities in it. How much is it? If you go to the Skyhound website um, and look at the street price, um, it's uh, th those are your prices in US dollars. Um, but the good news is uh, uh, we have now uh, a special offer from the developer. Don't, don't go to the Skyhound website directly, go through the RASP <coughs> website and buy the software there if you're interested in it and you will realize a 40% uh, discount. Um, th that will take you to the, the Sky Tools information page on the RASP national website that QR code um, if you're interested in learning a bit more about the software and then that has a link to the purchase page where you could buy the software through PayPal with your credit card or your PayPal account. Um, so if you do want to get the software, um, uh, visit the national website, log in, um, and again, you'll realize 40% off the regular, um, the regular price. Um, again, consider if you're somewhat interested but you want to stick your toes in the water, download the starter edition and you can try that for free um, and get a good sense of how it all works. Um, lots of information is available from these websites. 
including my blog. I have lots of information, quick reference guides and keyboard shortcuts. Uncle Rod Maliz, if you know him, he's a fan of this software as well. Um, and I've written about it in the journal. So if you look back to the 2015 editions of the journal, you'll find my review of Sky Tools there. And I also did a review of Astro Planner in the October 2016 edition. That's the Macintosh um, planning tool. Um, so you can read uh, the reviews there. A heads up, version four of the software is coming, but I don't know when. Um, but if you buy now, you'll get a discounted upgrade price as well. Um, so start planning. <coughs> you can buy the software inexpensively through your RASC membership. It's a new benefit or perk of membership. Uh, I've gone quite long here. I don't know if there's an opportunity for any questions. Definitely questions, yes. Okay. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I see. Oh, Clay, hi. Hey, Blake. Uh, first, I just want to thank you for negotiating this great deal on uh, this software. Oh, yeah. And great presentation. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm gung-ho to get it right now. I, I bought a computer specifically for Buy now. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, one query about... I don't get any benefit, by the way. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, one question about the uh, the Pro Edition. Can you scale down on the magnitude of stars that you'll actually see uh, on the, uh, the charts? Yeah, so that interactive atlas that comes up, there, there's a, a simple control where you can tell it, show me more stars, show me less stars. Beautiful. Um, so you can set the magnitude limit. It's also a scalar in that when you zoom in to the, the chart, it starts showing you fainter stars, which is analogous to you popping in a new eyepiece. Um, so it's smart that way. Um, and I rarely use it, but it also has the ability to control the lower and upper limits of the magnitudes of all displayed objects um, in it. So it's, it's very, very good. But the quick controls show me brighter stars, show me make the, scar make the sky brighter. Um, it, it's very easy to use that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Tom. So Blake, the system has a built-in uh, filter for 30 degrees uh, due to extinction uh, for the atmosphere. Question, does it have multiple filters? The reason I'm asking this is because when you use a Dobsonian to observe with, uh, you have the, all, the other thing you have to worry about is high altitude hole, as opposed yeah. to low because you've got a section of the sky, depending on your preferences, around 80 above 80 degrees from the horizon called the Dobson Hole where it's difficult to observe. Yeah. Can you, will that, uh, does it have that feature also? The, as far as I know, no actually, um, that it, it doesn't have a feature to exclude objects that are really high. I'm showing the filter menu and it, you, you can tell it look at things near maximum, which you don't want with a Dob. Um, so, so uh, I haven't seen that, the ability to filter out objects that are directly overhead um, there. <laughs> there you go, problem solved. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the new version of um, Sky Tools 4, I've noticed has a new uh, level in it that it's got the 30 degree marker and it has another one in it now. I think it's at 45. Um, so it looks like he's starting to add in, you know, there's obviously going to be lots of new features in it, but, but he's added in something like that. But um, I, can, I can ask the developer that. Um, I see a question for uh, Ed at the back there. Uh, any questions over there? Hey, Blake. So to, to kind of carry on from uh, Tom's question, like if you have a refractor or alt azimuth refractor on a tripod, in fact, the high level was one thing I was asking about. But also, you don't want to be putting it up and dropping it down on the tripod legs. It would be nice if the software had a way to say, give me the best stuff, but kind of don't make it go around from, you know, down here to up here to up and down a whole lot. I, like so I, rough area of the sky and then yeah. move on. So I think indirectly you can sort of do these things. I don't know of filters that specifically control this, but you saw the night bar showing you the elevation through the evening. 
Um, and the time sliders that you can move, you can put things in a window, you can put things in a box when they're going to be at a certain elevation in the sky. So using that, the night bar, and it's really hard to see the scale, but it's 0, 15, 30, 45, and so on. Um, and then using the, the red line time markers as your starting and ending points, that, that you, you could do that. Um, uh, you can also filter by constellation. Uh, so you can pick a specific constellation and hang out in that area. I often do that on cloudy nights. And you can also indicate a filter by the type of object. Um, so I, I, I think a few tricks like that, using the filters in a good way and using the time sliders and paying attention to the night bar and the elevation, effectively you can do that. Um, but there isn't a filter that says don't show things that are too high. For sure, I know there's not that. Yeah. Blake? Question. Will it run on older computers with older operating systems? This, this is a old, terribly old computer, um, Windows XP. Um, it, with four gigs of mem no, not four gig, two gigs of memory, um, a and a slow SSD. Okay, and it works fine. This is a nine-inch screen, so I feel hemmed in by the screen, um, and I'll hook it up to a, an external monitor if I can. But if I'm out in the field, this is what I use, and it and it works fine for that. Um, the, the, um, it, remember again, anybody that's in the computer business can appreciate this, that ultimately this is a database. So you know that databases want a fast hard disk. That's what you need if you're doing, if you're filtering on the Herschel 400 list, right, it's going to try to show you all 400 objects. Um, and you saw that slider going across when I was switching the filters, you know, it will lag a little bit in those cases. The software developer encourages people do not build huge lists with a thousand objects in it. Um, keep your observing list reasonable, 100, maybe 200 objects max. Um, what, what are you going to be able to observe in a, in a given evening or over a weekend? Um, so if you're not rushing, it's going to be 50, 40 objects as your starting point. Guy. Yeah, Blake, thanks again for this. It's great. Uh, I have one question, and you mentioned about using this in the field, and you have a screen like that up in a crowd of people. <laughs> You're not going to be very popular. Does it have like a red screen you can... <laughs> now, nah, perfect. That's what I wanted to It know. has a nice red screen mode. Thank you. Um, and doing that, actually, it did things behind the scenes. It actually went to the Windows desktop and shut off the desktop. Um, so all your icons that are in the background of your desktop that are also very bright, it's hidden all those. It's gone to a black screen for the desktop itself. Um, the external monitor is not showing that, but my prime monitor has gone black um, here. Also, the red light mode is adjustable. You can actually change the intensity of the, the red. And I, now I still put a red film on my screen um, to uh, attenuate it even further. Um, but it's a, it's a good red mode, and all the charts have switched into high contrast red on black backgrounds as well. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty good, pretty smart red mode. Yeah. yeah. So Blake, I have a quick question about transient objects. You may or may not have mentioned comets, but notice in yeah. Andy's presentation, you mentioned a comet. And so one, a comet's one example. Another example might be a nova, like recent nova persei. But yeah. the question is, um, yeah, so if you suppose a fast moving comet, most of them don't move too much in one night. But it's pretty good at plotting when's the right time of night to see this comet. But does it have coordinates? And usually when you um, see some projection for a comet, you'd want to know how old is its uh, ephemeris, or is it up to, up to the hour, up to the date, or whatever. Yeah. So do you happen to know about how it handles yeah. engine objects like comets or NOVA, if it knows about a NOVA? Yeah, yeah. So good question, and, and the short answer is yes, all this data is quite current. Now it is ultimately that data is updated by the author, um, so you got to wait for him to do the update, and he does sometimes get bogged down, but in general, he's updating that data on a very regular basis. Um, that's also what drives his uh, website. So the Skyhound website has the comet chasing page at Skyhound. That's one of like errorist.net. That's one of the popular destinations for people looking up comet information. So he, that might be where SkyTool software started, is he wrote the engine um, to generate uh, uh, current data 
uh, on these comments. Now, I'm, I'm pointing to a command called update current list from the web. I won't run it right now, but it would crawl out to his website and get new current information uh, under this category. Um, so under the current group, there's current comets, current minor planets, um, and current uh, supernova and nova. Um, so, so those are all being updated. If you do this at the beginning uh, uh, of your weekend, um, you're going to have pretty current information there. So when I'm doing my session planning um, for a dark sky weekend, I make a point of updating all the comet information. And then I look at, let's look at the current comets, and I'll sort by magnitude, and, and I'll pick off, okay, here's some bright ones here, um, and I'll add those, and I'll copy those to, to my list. Um, and uh, similar sort of things with supernova. Um, uh, uh, also, there's the ephemeris tab, right, um, here. So that's in, the, uh, that's in the standard and pro editions. So you can have a plot or a table that shows you all the ephemeris in, information here. Um, I didn't mention these other tabs, but the current events is what I use to help me with the Sky This Month presentations. And that generally gives me a month at a glance calendar. It's almost perfect. Um, I do all my formatting, as you may know, in mine, but, but it's, uh, that's very, very good for giving me a list of interesting events that are going on. Um, the other thing that I'll briefly mention um, is that um, you can choose a comet. Uh, I don't know if I can do this really, really quickly here, so give me, give me a second um, to see if I can generate this really fast. Um, but I, I chose one of those comets. I'm going to have to zoom into it. Um, here, so I'm zooming into this comet now, uh, and if it's got a tail, the software is going to represent that. See how it's sluggish here? Um, it's trying to draw all the faint stars. Oh, there's a little tail showing on it here. Um, uh, I'll zoom out one level, um, but I'm going to activate the, um, the tracking trail thingamabob um, feature here. So on this target object for the next, oh, not years. Um, <laughs> So maybe I'll switch that to days, right? Days, and it's doing the plot now. It's going to show me where that's going to move. There, I don't know if you can see that red text there, but that's showing maybe day by day or hour by hour position changes. Um, and I've used that effectively to, to do some photography of a comet and to specifically track it as it, as it moves. That is blurry stars and a, a nice focused comet. So it's very good about current stuff. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Blake, well, let's stop it there. Yeah. Now. Uh, I'm sure Blake will be around after the <laughs> meeting to take more questions. Thank you.